I am going to uh, pray and get us started. God, thank you so much for uh, this time that we get to gather as your church, your holy ones, the, the saints. God, you are, are so gracious and so wise to have uh, formed the church the way you have to uh, move the gospel across land and sea through faithful men and women uh, so that we would find ourselves here in Tempe, Arizona, uh, meeting and, and doing what the saints that we read about in Scripture did, uh, heeding to the apostles' doctrine, spurring one another on to loving good deeds. Um, and God, this is uh, just so precious to us. Pray that you would continue to use the preaching of your word to stir up affections in us for you, for one another, that we would gain clarity from the clarity of your word and how we must live, uh, who we must be. And God, I pray that you would use this time to purify our motives uh, for gathering, purify our motives for drawing near to one another, uh, for listening attentively to your word as it's taught. God, I pray that as, uh, as I speak, you would make me be clear. And as we consider uh, a group of faithful uh, men who labored to see what is happening today happen, uh, English speakers, reading your word, uh, having your word on their lips, uh, in their thoughts, and submitting to it with all of their lives. God, give us boldness to walk in, in the same way as, as those who came before us did who were faithful. I pray that this time would be useful to that end. In Christ's name, amen. All right, this is part four of our Blood for Clarity series. In this particular lesson, I want to do something a little bit different, uh, and, and so it'll actually feel quite a bit different than, uh, well, what you usually hear uh, in Equipping Hour and on a Sunday, but even from uh, what our emphasis has been and what our approach has been the past three weeks, uh, you know, we've just looked at passage after passage after passage as it pertains to the clarity or perspicuity of God's word. And this morning, I want to uh, turn our attention from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, to a season uh, that came later, and, and that season is the 16th century. The 16th century. So uh, if you're a student of church history, you know that the 1500s was the time that, uh, that we know as the Reformation, when God's word and biblical doctrines were sort of recovered uh, from the powers that were, that be at the time, uh, the, the Catholic church that dominated not only the spiritual life, but even political life of uh, the, the known world at the time, uh, particularly in Europe, the Reformation was when the Word of God was recovered and very brave, courageous, godly men stood against all of, all of the authority uh, of the Catholic Church, and they labored to make God's voice known. And so uh, what, I'm, what I want to do this morning to just, uh, again, strengthen our confidence in the clarity of Scripture is I'm going to be doing quite a bit of reading from extra-biblical sources. Uh, and where we have done over the past three weeks a deep dive into Scripture and just looked at uh, 
uh, a wealth of passages and principles from the text of Scripture. I want to help us have an appreciation for why today we're able to do the very thing that we do week in and week out when you hear God's Word preached and you read God's Word at your kitchen table over coffee and those kinds of things. So this morning, what we have in our outline are two considerations from the 16th century to strengthen our confidence in the clarity of Scripture. Two considerations. Uh, those considerations are, one, the context in which the Reformation occurred and the convictions for which the Reformers suffered. Okay? We'll look at the context first in which the Reformation occurred. What would it, what would it have been like if you were living in the 16th century and even uh, some, you know, thousand years prior to that, from about 500 to uh, 1500, was a very dark period uh, while the Catholic Church held sway. Um, because uh, I, instead of just inserting lots of quotes in, uh, my notes, which probably would have left me with very little sleep last night. Uh, I'm, I'm reading from a couple volumes that uh, John Anderson actually introduced uh, us to in a class that we took uh, a couple years ago, hi the history of the English Reformation. And so a French historian, J.H. Merle Dubigny, uh, who was a faithful pastor and church historian, chronicled in several volumes the history of the Reformation. And Banner of Truth put out uh, two volumes, republished a couple volumes of specifically the Reformation in England. This was uh, our main text for that class with John. And so instead of uh, just putting page after page into my notes, I just, I just brought the books with me. <laughs> uh, and so I'll be flipping around and, and turning uh, in this volume and reading for you uh, from here. And so the context in which the Reformation occurred, there's a few things that you need to know about what it was like to live during that time. And for starters, the English Bible was inaccessible. <laughs> the English Bible was inaccessible. Uh, it wasn't until John Wycliffe, who's called the Morning Star of the Reformation, he came just before the Reformation, he was sort of a pre-reformer, uh, teaching the same things that in, 50, in the 1500s, the Reformation or the Reformers began to teach. He was ahead of the game. So he's called the, Re the Morning Star of the Reformation. And here's what Dubigny says about the 1380s when Wycliffe actually lived. He says, scholasticism had banished the scriptures into a mysterious obscurity. It is true that Bede had translated the Gospel of John, that the learned men of Alfred's court had translated the four evangelists, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that Elfric in the reign of Ethereld II had translated some books of the Old Testament, that an Anglo-Norman priest had paraphrased the Gospels and the Acts, that Richard Roll, the hermit of Hampole, and some pious clerks in the 14th century had produced a version of the Psalms, the Gospels, and Epistles. But these were rare volumes. But these rare volumes were hidden like theological curiosities in the libraries of a few monasteries. It was then a maxim that the reading of the Bible was injurious to the laity. And accordingly, the priests forbade it just as the Brahmins forbade the Shastras to the Hindus. So you can hear, even though some people had translated various portions of the Bible, kind of piecemealed, uh, select books or sections of scripture together for English speakers, that was only helpful to a, an elite few. They were tucked away in monasteries and, and not available to the common people. So the English Bible during this time uh, was pretty much non-existent. 
and John Wycliffe, what he labored to do, even though he didn't know Hebrew and Greek, the original languages of Scripture, he took Jerome's Latin Vulgate, which was the standard for hundreds of years, and he translated the Latin Vulgate into English uh, to no little disturbance of the Catholic Church. Uh, and so that was really all that was available. It was forbidden to own a copy. Uh, and so essentially the, the English Bible for the average person was completely inaccessible. Um, we, re we would have a hard time imagining what life would be like if the Bible wasn't available to us. Uh, our, the, the way we live has been thoroughly shaped by Protestantism, uh, by principles learned and taught during the Reformation. Um, we would have a hard time in our minds even undoing all of that if we were, if we were asked to. And so in this context, the English Bible was inaccessible. Also, fast forward uh, about 140 years, the Greek New Testament was published. The Greek New Testament uh, was published by uh, a man named Erasmus. Um, Erasmus, really, uh, for, for people in our circles, Erasmus's claim to fame is uh, what Luther said against him, <laughs> is usually what most people know about him. Uh, he was a Catholic, and he's kind of a mixed bag because he loved... Uh, learning, and he loved uh, knowledge, and so he wanted great books published just for the sake of information and uh, sort of raising the bar on the intellectual standard of the day, and so he, against the uh, wishes of the Catholic Church and the leaders at the time, published a Greek version of the New Testament. And so he, the, the volume included uh, a column with the Greek New Testament alongside Jerome's uh, Vulgate. And so people, if you could speak Greek, um, which learned people could, uh, they could, or not speak, but read uh, Greek, um, they could access the Bible in a language they could understand. Um, this was uh, loved by, you know, people who loved Erasmus for doing this, uh, who had education, um, but it was hated by the Roman Catholic Church. Um, let me just read to you another passage that uh, describes the reception of this book. The New Testament in Greek and Latin had hardly appeared when it was received by all men of upright mind with unprecedented enthusiasm. Never had any book produced such a sensation. It was in every hand. Men struggled to procure it, read it eagerly, read it eagerly, and would even kiss it. The words it contained enlightened every heart. <clears throat> But a reaction soon took place. Traditional Catholicism uttered a cry from the depths of its noisome, noisome pools. Franciscans and Dominicans, priests and bishops, not daring to attack the educated and well-born, went among the ignorant populace and endeavored by their tales and clamors to stir up susceptible men and credulous, men, credulous women. Here are horrible heresies, they exclaimed. Here are frightful antichrists. If this book be tolerated, it will be the death of the papacy. We must drive this man from the university, said one. We must turn him out of the church, added another. And so you can hear something of the uh, disdain of those who didn't want the Bible in the common hands of men and women. Duvignier goes on to say, this irritation was not without a cause. The book, indeed, contained nothing but Latin and Greek, but this first step seemed to augur another 
the translation of the Bible into the vulgar tongue. And so what he's, what he's saying there is, it wasn't that the Greek and Latin version was so bad to have itself. The ultimate damage of having that book is that it became, uh, or it spurred on men to translate the Bible into the common language of the people, English. And so this was a stepping stone into having the English Bible. Uh, the King James uh, Version actually received its translation from what Erasmus published in the Greek. So the, the English translations, uh, the first English translations, we'll talk about some of them, came from this version of the Greek scriptures. And then um, I've got a, another quote up for you. The shorter ones I, I, I included in the, uh, in the outline if we have it up. Do we, do we have it up yet? Excellent. Um, one man said, who used to be Erasmus's friend before he published the Greek New Testament, Edward Lee, he said, if we do not stop this leak, when he heard, uh, said he when he heard of the New Testament, it will sink the ship, Think, thinking about Roman Catholicism. And then Dubinier notes, nothing terrifies the defenders of human traditions so much as the word of God. Also in, this, in the context of the Reformation, Bible reading was considered positively dangerous. It was considered dangerous to allow people to read the Bible Among the Dominicans, there was a friar, android and skillful in little manners. It was the prior Bokenham. No one had shown more hatred against the evangelical Christians, and no one was in truth a gr greater stranger to the gospel. This is the person that the Catholic Church is going to put forward to start teaching against what the Protestants are teaching. This was the man commissioned to set forth the dangers of the word of God. He was by no means familiar with the New Testament. He opened it, however, picked out a few passages here and there which seemed to favor his thesis, and then arrayed in his costliest robes with head erect and solemn step, already sure of victory, he went into the pulpit, combated the heretic, talking about Hugh, Hugh Latimer, and with pompous voice stormed against the reading of the Bible. It was in his eyes the fountain of all heresies and misfortunes. Scripture, he said, is full of figurative language, which the laity, that's the common person, will be certain to misinterpret to their own ruin. If that heresy should prevail, he exclaimed, there will be an end of everything useful among us. The plowman reading in the gospel that no man having put his hand to the plow should look back would soon lay aside his labor. The baker reading that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump will in future make us nothing but very insipid bread. And the simple man finding himself commanded to pluck out the right eye and cast it from thee, England, after a few years, will be a frightful spectacle. It will be little better than a nation of blind and one-eyed men sadly begging their bread from door to door. This is really what he was afraid of if people had the Bible, that they wouldn't understand figurative language? Um, you're the proof that that's not the case. So he was teaching, and, and this was common, to teach about how dangerous reading the Bible is. And in one sense, I would like to agree. Men and women who read their Bible are dangerous to those who teach error. Also, the, in the context of the Reformation, not only was the English Bible inaccessible, the Greek New Testament was published, Bible reading was considered dangerous, but clear scripture was being subjected to human interpreters. Clear, unambiguous scriptures were being subjected to human interpreters. 
This is from a Swiss, this next quote is from a, a Swiss reformer, Ulrich Zwingli, who uh, became known for his exposition. He gave uh, this sermon on the, uh, what did he call it? The, on the clarity and certainty of the word of God. He preached this sermon he got permission to preach this sermon to a bunch of nuns uh, in a convent, and the sermon had such an impact that they banned uh, Catholic priests from teaching and said only people who believe what that guy believes can preach. <laughs> uh, here's what he said in that sermon. The Samaritan woman was clever enough to say to Christ, in John 4, I know the Messiah comes, which is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. And our theologians, referring to the Catholic theologians at the time, have not yet learned that lesson. Ask them if they understand the words, Christ is caput ecclesiae, that is, Christ is head of the congregation or church, which is his body. They will answer, yes, they understand those words very well, but they may not do so apart from the official pronouncements of men. What poor creatures, rather than allow themselves to be vanquished by the truth, they deny that they are men, as if they had no ordinary intelligence and did not know the meaning of a kaput, and all that in order to subject the truth to the Caiaphases and Annases as its official interpreters. And what he's talking about there is, you know, Caiaphas and Annas being the high priests of the day who murdered Jesus, uh, who held the authority over the people when it came to the scriptures. Um, people, these teachers, these men and women who could clearly understand what scripture was saying, instead of saying, wow, that is clear, I understand, would rather have said, I need the church, I need the bishops of the Catholic church to interpret the Bible for me, and where they might disagree with the clear words of scripture, they defer to the interpretation of those men, which is just foolish. Um, th the same thing happens uh, in the, the Roman Catholic religion today. I was sitting next to a, uh, a guy on a plane one time, and I don't remember how we struck up a conversation, but uh, he was Catholic, I found out. And so we started talking about the gospel. How can someone be made right with God? He obviously believed in uh, salvation by works mingled with faith. And so I went to one of the, the clearest passages that I knew to reference on that very issue, Romans chapter 4, uh, verses 4 and 5. Don't the Yates have a license plate with that on it? Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, Smed and Janet are going to get to heaven and find out there are other people there who read their license plate. <laughs> Romans 4, 4 says, Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. You don't get a favor at the end of a week or every other week or on the 1st and 15th. Your employer is not doing you a favor. He's giving you what he owes you because you worked for that those of you with jobs. Verse 5, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. That can't get any clearer. The one who does not work, but instead believes, faith is opposed to works in this context. When it comes to salvation and what you must do to be saved, they are complete opposites. The one who does not work but simply believes in God who justifies the ungodly, declares the ungodly righteous. His faith is credited as righteousness. This gentleman on the plane acknowledged what the passage sounded like it was saying and then said, but that's not, not how the Catholic Church takes that. And when I asked him, well, what, did, what do they say about this? He wasn't even sure but he knew this was in contradiction to Catholic doctrine. And so he couldn't accept the plain words of the text because he was deferring to men. The same thing happened uh, in a Cafe Rio. Uh, I was with Cameron uh, Roberts, 
and we had just finished cleaning pools when I was cleaning pools at the time for Jerry. And we saw Mormons, you know, helpfully, they stand out. The Mormon missionaries, you know, they all look the same in the uniform. Great, let's go sit next to them. Struck up a conversation while we were eating. And we looked at Titus chapter 3. And as we talked about them, about how someone is made right with God, they preached the same thing that the Catholics did by works. And I asked if they had ever read Titus 3, 5. And they said no. So I read it to them. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. And to their credit, one of them said, uh, when I asked, I said, doesn't it sound like that saying, we're not saved by deeds, but just by God's mercy? He said, yeah, that is what it sounds like. And even admitting that with no other defense said, you know, essentially he couldn't accept it because that was contradictory to everything he had been taught. Um, and he never responded to my text. That's kind of how that goes. I don't know, maybe it's me. Um, it, this was commonplace during the Reformation, and, and it's still the same today. It's clear scripture is being subjected to human interpreters. It's interesting to even read the uh, canons, what are called canons of the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent was a several-year event where the leaders of the Roman Catholic religion would get together and it was really the response, like a formal response during the 1500s to what was being taught by Protestants. Um, people were opening up God's word for the first time in a long time and able to have clarity that they were not granted by the powers that be. And so the Pope had to organize a formal response. And so this council got together to say, here's uh, what we actually believe about everything you see happening in the world right now around you. In their fourth session, which took place on April 18th of 1546, they, the fourth session has to do with what they believe about scripture. And if you, if you read it, it's, it's publicly accessible. You could pull it up um, online. What they taught about scripture, you can see them restricting not only the reading of scripture, but under penalty, uh, you know, severe penalty even of death, people were prohibited from owning these books that were being circulated. They were prohibited from printing them. So even if you were caught printing them, uh, you could be punished and fined and those kinds of things. I'm just going to read a, a portion from the, the fourth session of the Council of Trent. Furthermore, in order to restrain petulant spirits, this is the, the synod writing this, the synod decrees that no one relying on his own skill in matters of faith and of morals pertaining to the edification of Christian doctrine, resting the sacred scripture to his own senses, uh, that is not in keeping with the, the Roman Catholic interpretation, dare to interpret the said sacred scripture contrary to that sense which Holy Mother Church, whose it is to judge of the true sense and interpretation of the Holy Scriptures, hath held and doth hold, or even contrary to the unanimous consent of the fathers, that's a farce. There is no unanimous consent of the church fathers. Even though such like interpretations were never intended to be at any time published, they who shall contravene shall be made known by their ordinaries and be punished with the penalties by law established. Um, so you even see them requiring their ordinaries, the other, you know, your neighbors have to turn you in if they find out that you're propagating literature that interprets scripture differently than, than the church, the church at the time. Um, they even say, you'll notice whose it is to judge of the true sense and interpretation of the Holy Scriptures. Uh, 
they would say the church holds the authority on the interpretation of Scripture. And we would absolutely disagree. We would say that God holds the interpretation of the Scriptures. God is the interpreter of the Scriptures and not man, ultimately. Who gets to determine what God meant? Well, God does. And it is our job to merely discover what the true meaning of the Scriptures is, uh, those of us who have clarity. Another thing to note during the time of the Reformation is that the way of salvation was unknown. The way of salvation was completely unknown, hidden in obscurity by the prevailing opinions of the day. Again, this is uh, from Zwingli's sermon on the clarity and certainty of God's word. He gives this illustration, and this is a, a, a real illustration of things that he had experienced in the day. He said, a man is longing for his soul's salvation, and he asks a Christian, or excuse me, a Carthusian, that's a one order of, of monks, and he'll go through several of them. This man who's longing for his soul's salvation goes to this order, dear brother, what must I do to be saved? And the answer will undoubtedly be this, enter our order, and you will assuredly be saved, for it is the most rigorous. But ask a Benedictine, and he replies, it is worth noting that salvation, salvation is easiest in our order, for it is the most ancient. But if you ask a Dominican, he will answer, in our order, salvation is certain, for it was given from heaven by Our Lady, referencing Mary. And if you ask a Franciscan, he will say, our order is the greatest and most famous of all. Consider then whether you will find salvation more easily in any other. And if you ask the Pope, he will say it is easiest with an indulgence. And if you ask those of Compostela, they will say, if you come here to St. James, you will never be lost and will never be poor. You see, they all show you some different way, and they all contend fiercely that their way is the right one. But the seeking soul cries out, alas, who shall I follow? They all argue so persuasively that I am at a loss what to do. And finally, it can only run to God and earnestly pray to him, saying, O oh God, show me which order or which way is the most certain. And then Zwingli adds this counsel, You fool, you go to God simply that he may distinguish between men. And you do not ask him to show you that way of salvation which is pleasing to him and which he himself regards as sure and certain. Note that you are merely asking God to confirm something which men have told you. Why do you not say, oh God, they all disagree amongst themselves, but you are the only unconcealed good. Show me the way of salvation. And the gospel in scripture gives us a sure message or answer or assurance. <laughs> Remember, he's saying this to nuns. He's fighting for Scripture being God's voice, unadulterated, with no mediator, to say, here's what that clear passage is saying. You can understand the clear passage by reading the clear passage and let God speak to you on his own. And people weren't able to do that at the time uh, and were taught not to do that at the time because the scriptures, again, were taught that they were dangerous. And so this was the day that the reformers lived in. This was the times. This was the, the water they were swimming in. This is what it was like to be alive then. And so number two is going to be helpful. Thank you. <laughs> is going to be helpful to also not only consider the context in which the Reformation occurred, but the convictions for which the Reformers suffered. The convictions for which the Reformers suffered. First, the, the scriptures are objectively clear. It's the same thing we've been saying week after week. Uh, we stand in good company with the things we've been saying the past three weeks. The scriptures are objectively clear. Hear what Martin Luther said in his book, The Bondage of the Will. There's a, another quote up for you on the screen. 
He says, I know that to many people a great deal remains obscure, but that is due not to any lack of clarity in Scripture, but to their own blindness and dullness in that they make no effort to see truth, which in itself could not be plainer. They are like men who cover their eyes or go from daylight into darkness and hide there and then blame the sun or the darkness of the day for their inability to see. So let wretched men abjure that blasphemous perversity which would blame the darkness of their own hearts on the plain scriptures of God. The fact that some men don't see the scriptures clearly is to no fault of God's. And bondage of the will is a uh, phenomenal example of the clarity of Scripture and how to use Scripture in apologetics. Um, Luther really only spends a, a, a short section saying something about the, the plainness of the Scriptures, like defending the perspicuity of Scriptures in this way. That's where this quote comes from, that section. But the entire book, what he does is this is a response to Erasmus, because Erasmus, even after he published the Greek New Testament, uh, defended Roman Catholicism uh, and, and their doctrine, and he actually continued to teach that the scriptures were too obscure um, to be understood by unlearned people. And so in his defense of the Catholic view of free will, and where he really takes shots at God's sovereignty and God's freedom of will, Luther responds, and he doesn't pull in his own passages to say, hey, my passages can beat up your passages. But what he does is he just explains properly Erasmus's passages. The passages that Erasmus used to teach free will uh, for Roman Catholics, Luther says, here's what you misunderstand about that passage. Here's what you uh, didn't read rightly about that passage. Here's some observations from that passage that prove it can't be saying what you think it's saying. Uh, that is just a phenomenal uh, book if you have an opportunity to read it. And so more than just uh, teaching on Scripture's clarity, Luther just shows you that Scripture's clear by properly interpreting it. Uh, not only were, did they teach, were they convinced that Scripture was objectively clear, they were convinced that the Scriptures were clear enough to convert those who read them. The Scriptures were so clear, they could convert those who read them. And uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to tell you about one of my heroes, <laughs> Thomas Bilney. Thomas Bilney. Um, we, we recently had um, a fifth child. I pushed really hard to name him Bilney. Um, didn't pass. <laughs> but we do have uh, lots of pregnant women in this church <laughs> regularly, so consider Bilney, okay? Um, he is a hero of the Reformation, uh, not even primarily because of his uh, personal uh, ministry and, and influence, but he influenced and discipled men and evangelized, and people were converted through his ministry that went on to exceed his influence and had great um, impact in the Reformation. I want to read to you from DuVigny about Thomas Bilney's uh, testimony, essentially. There was in Trinity Hall, Cambridge, a young student of the canon of law, of serious turn of mind and bashful disposition, and whose tender conscience strove, although ineffectually, to fulfill the commandments of God. Anxious about his salvation, Thomas Bilney applied to the priests whom he looked upon as physicians of the soul. Kneeling before his confessor, with humble look and pale face, he told him all his sins, and even those of which he doubted. 
The priests prescribed at one time fasting, at another prolonged vigils, and then masses and indulgences, which cost him dearly. Bilney went through all these practices with such devotion, but found no consolation in them. Being weak and slender, his body wasted away by degrees. His understanding grew weaker, his imagination faded, and his purse became empty. Alas, said he with anguish, my last state is worse than my first. From time to time, an idea crossed his mind. May not the priest be seeking their own gain and not the salvation of my soul? But immediately rejecting the rash doubt, he fell back under the iron hand of the clergy. One day, Bilney heard his friends talking about a new book. It was the Greek Testament printed with a translation which was highly praised for its elegant Latinity. Attracted by the beauty of the style rather than by the divinity of the subject, he stretched out his hand, but just as he was going to take the volume, fear came upon him and he withdrew it hastily. In fact, the confessor strictly prohibited Greek and Hebrew books, the sources of all heresies, and Erasmus's testament was particularly forbidden. Yet Bilney regretted so great a sacrifice. Was it not the testimony of Jesus Christ? Might not God have placed therein some word which perhaps might heal his soul? He stepped forward and then shrank back again, and at last he took courage. Urged, he said he, by the hand of God, he walked out of the college, slipped into the house where the volume was sold in secret, bought it with fear and trembling, and then hastened back and shut himself up in his room. He opened it. His eyes caught these words. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. What is he reading? What passage? 1 Timothy 1.15. He laid down the book and meditated on the astonishing declaration. What? St. Paul, the chief of sinners? And yet St. Paul is sure of being saved? He read the verse again and again. O assertion of St. Paul, how sweet art thou to my soul, he exclaimed. This declaration continually haunted him, and in this manner, God instructed him in the secret of his heart. He could not tell what had happened to him. It seemed as if a refreshing wind were blowing over his soul, or as if a rich treasure had been placed in his hands. The Holy Spirit took what was Christ's, and announced it to him. I also am like Paul, exclaimed him with emotion. And more than Paul, I the greatest of sinners, but Christ saves sinners. And at last I have heard of Jesus. His doubts were ended, he was saved. Then took place in him a wonderful transformation and unknown joy pervaded him. His conscience until then sore with the wounds of sin was healed. Instead of despair, he felt an inward peace passing all understanding. Jesus Christ, exclaimed he, yes, Jesus Christ saves. Such is the character of the Reformation. It is Jesus Christ who saves and not the church. I see it all, said Bilney. My vigils, my fasts, my pilgrimages, my purchases of masses and indulgences were destroying instead of saving me. All these efforts were, as St. Augustine says, a hasty running out of the way. He just picked up the scriptures and read them, and they saved him. How sweet is that? And some of you have a similar testimony. No teacher, just picked up the Bible, led by God to do so, and he saved you because he spoke clearly in his word to you. They also were convinced, the reformers were, that the scriptures must be translated into the vulgar tongue. The vulgar tongue, and that just means common language. The man most responsible for the Bible that you have in your lap, that you read on your phone and your other devices, is William Tyndale. William Tyndale was the first English speaker probably has had the greatest command of the English language to date. Uh, He had such a command of the English language, uh, such a proficient linguist, knew something of like eight languages. And after all of that learning, 
resigned himself to poverty and hunger and living on the run from the Catholic Church, left England because he couldn't safely translate the scriptures. So he uh, lived his life in obscurity and in hiding because he was convinced that the people who spoke English had to have the Bible. He could have done anything he wanted with his life, with the amount of education and uh, intelligence that he possessed, and he committed all of that to the most worthy cause of translating the scriptures, just like our missionaries <laughs> are laboring to do with their lives. This was William Tyndale, a tra trailblazer in Bible translation for the English-speaking world. He was convinced that the scriptures had to be translated into the vulgar tongue. Um, I'm looking at the time. I'm, I'm, I'm going to read it. Next, next, uh, next slide. He said in the uh, preface that he wrote to the, uh, the f five books of Moses, to the Pentateuch, he wrote prefaces to introduce these translations. And he says this, a thousand books had never lever to be put forth against their abominable doings and doctrine than that the scripture should come to light. He's saying that the the priests of the day would rather have a thousand books be written against them than that the scriptures be published in English. For as long as they may keep that down, they will so darken the right way with, their mist, with the mist of their sophistry and so tangle them that either rebuke or despise their abominations with arguments of philosophy and with worldly similitudes and apparent reasons of natural wisdom and with resting the scriptures unto their own purpose, clean contrary unto the process, order, and meaning of the text. Uh, what, he's, what he's getting at there is that uh, they're able and willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in philosophical wranglings uh, based on human wisdom so anybody who wants to write any book against us on the basis of something other than the Word of God, bring it on. That's preferable. He goes on, and they would so delude them in descanting upon it with allegories and amaze them, expounding it in many senses before the unlearned lay people, when it hath but one simple literal sense, whose light to owls cannot abide, whose light the owls cannot abide. Talking about the light of God's word. That though they that though thou feel in thine heart and art sure how that all is false that they say, yet couldst thou not solve their subtle riddles. Which thing only moved me? This thing only moved me to translate the New Testament because I had perceived by experience how that it was impossible to establish the lay people in any truth except the scripture were plainly laid before their eyes in their mother tongue that they might see the process, order, and meaning of the text. Without the scriptures in plain language that can be understood by the people, then the stratagems of these deceivers could always prevail. There's, an, there's a, a story that Dubigny chronicles about William Tyndale. He is away in the city of Antwerp. He's fled England because he can't survive there and safely translate the Bible due to uh, persecution and people seeking his life. So he goes where he can somewhat uh, safely, at least in hiding, translate the scriptures. King Henry VIII, the king of England, founds, finds out about William Tyndale and uh, that he's somewhere in Antwerp. So he sends an official ambassador to win William Tyndale and bring him back to English. Um, the foremost linguist and scholar of the day is your countryman, belongs in your kingdom, and Henry found out that he wasn't living there, uh, and he wanted William Tyndale to come uh, essentially be a part of his court and uh, 
labor for the king. Um, here, Dubigny chronicles a little bit about why this was uh, refused by, by Tyndale. He says, Tyndale, who had heard of Henry's new plans, had no confidence either in the prince or in his pretended reformation. And the, the Prince Henry and the Catholic Church were, were at odds. The king's endless negotiations with the pope, his worldliness, his amours, his persecution of evangelical Christians, and especially the ignominious punishment inflicted on John Tyndale, all these matters disgusted him. However, having been informed of the nature of Vaughn's mission, that's the king's ambassador, he desired to turn it to advantage by addressing a few warnings to the prince, that is King Henry. Here's what he tells Vaughn to tell King Henry. I have written certain books, he said, to warn his majesty of the subtle demeanor of the clergy of his realm toward his person, in which doing I showed the heart of a true subject. Uh, he's talking about the, uh, uh, a book that he wrote defending the king's right to rule politically apart from the church's right over uh, the church's God-given authority over spiritual matters. Um, and so he's telling Henry, hey, don't forget that book that I wrote that actually defended your right to rule the kingdom against the, the pope. So I'm actually a true subject. I'm loyal to the king. He goes on, to the intent that his grace might prepare remedies against their subtle dreams. An exile from my native country, I suffer hunger, thirst, cold, absence of friends everywhere encompassed with great danger in innumerable hard and sharp fightings. I do not feel their asperity by reason that I hope with my labors to do honor to God, true service to my prince and pleasure to his commons. You see, he's talking about all of his sufferings and saying, you know, it's really not suffering. <laughs> I don't even, it doesn't even feel like suffering for me because of what I'm laboring for. I know that this is this is a worthy cause. Cheer up, said Vaughn. Your exile, poverty, fightings, all are at an end. You can return to England. What matters it, said Tyndale, if my exile finishes so long as the Bible is banished? King Henry didn't let the Bible be, be propagated either. Has the king forgotten that God has commanded his word to be spread throughout the world? If it continues to be forbidden to his subjects, very death were more pleasant to me than life. Vaughn did not consider himself worsted. The messenger who remained at a distance and could hear nothing was astonished at seeing the two men in that solitary field conversing together so long and with such animation. Uh, the way this worked out in Antwerp, uh, Vaughn goes to find Tyndale and he can't find him, but he gets a knock at the door one day and some guy, random guy shows up and says, hey, the person you're looking for wants to meet with you. Uh, and he says, you need to be here at this time. And so Vaughn shows up, and then there's this figure that approaches him. It's William Tyndale. So, you know, Tyndale, like, finds him and arranges this meeting. Uh, and so the messenger is watching the two men talk. Uh, eventually, Tyndale is lingering there too long. He, he's uh, afraid for his life and says, you know, he recognizes the precarious situation he's in. So he, he leaves. Uh, and says, you know, I'll see you again soon. Vaughn brings, sends back word to the king that I talked to him, but he's not coming. <laughs> king Henry didn't take that too well. So he sends Vaughn back to, say, to have a second meeting, and again, can't find Tyndale. Tyndale finds him, arranges a second meeting, uh, and here's what Dubigny, how he chronicles that second meeting, um, King Henry, in uh, an attempt to be gracious, says, I'll forgive him for not obeying me and coming back to England um, if the second time he concedes. And so Vaughn, whose heart Tyndale had gained, began to hunt for him again and had a second interview with him. He gave him Cromwell's letter to read, and with the ref when the reformer came to the words uh, we have just quoted that King Henry was willing to forgive his uh, refusal, 
his eyes, Tyndale's eyes, filled with tears. What gracious words, he exclaimed. Yes, said Vaughn, they have such sweetness that they would break the hardest heart of, in the world. Right? You coming now? Tyndale, deeply moved, tried to find some mode of fulfilling his duty toward God and towards the king. If his majesty, Tyndale said, would condescend to permit only a bare text of the scriptures to circulate among the people as they do in the states of the emperor and in, order, in other Christian countries, I would bind myself never to write again. I would throw myself at his feet, offering my body as a sacrifice, ready to submit, if necessary, to torture and to death. The foremost scholar in the world says, I'll never pick up a pen again if I can finish, if he will let me finish the translation and if he promises to circulate that amongst the common, amongst the common people. But a gulf lay between the monarch and the reformer, Henry and Tyndale. Henry VIII saw the seeds of heresy in the scripture, and Tyndale rejected every reformation which they wished to carry out by proscribing or restricting the Bible. Heresy springeth not from the scripture, he said, no more than darkness from the sun. Tyndale disappeared again, and the name of his hiding place is unknown. So, didn't work out. You can see there Tyndale's insistence that the people have to have the Bible. Well, that conviction eventually led to his martyrdom. And I want to just read how he died, at least uh, the, you know, he was, his, his kindness was taken advantage of. He made friends with someone who was actually hired by the Catholic Church to find him and turn him into the authorities. And that's exactly what ended up happening. Um, he, once they, once they got him, he was uh, put on trial. Since he wouldn't recant, uh, they sentenced him to death. Duvenier writes, religious courage was personified in Tyndale. He had never suffered himself to be stopped by any difficulty, privation, or suffering. He had resolutely followed the call he had received, which was to give England the word of God. Nothing had terrified him. Nothing had dispirited him. With admirable perseverance, he had continued his work, and now he was going to give his life for it. Firm in his convictions, he had never sacrificed the least truth to prudence or to fear. Firm in his hope, he had never doubted that he labored, that the labor of his life would bear fruit, for that labor had the promises of God. A pious and intrepid man, he is one of the noblest examples of Christian heroism. The faint hope which some of Tyndale's friends had entertained on seeing the delay of justice was soon destroyed. The imperial government prepared at last to complete the wishes of the priests. Friday, the 6th of October, 1536, was the day that terminated the miserable but glorious life of the reformer. The gates of the prison rolled back, a procession crossed the, fo crossed the fosse and the bridge under which slept the waters of the scene, passed the outer walls, and halted without the fortifications. Before leaving the castle, Tyndale, a grateful friend, had entrusted the jailer with a letter intended for points. And this is the man who turned him in. The jailer took it himself to Antwerp not long after, but it has not come down to us. On arriving at the scene of punishments, the reformer found a numerous crowd assembled. The government had wished to show the people the punishment of a heretic, but they only wished, they only witnessed the triumph of a martyr. Tyndale was calm. I call God to record, he said, that I have never altered against the voice of my conscience one syllable of his word, nor would do this day if all the pleasures, honors, and riches of the earth might be given me. The joy of hope filled his heart, yet one painful idea took possession of him. Dying far from his country, abandoned by his king, he felt saddened at the thought that that prince who had already persecuted so many of God's servants and who remained obstinately rebellious against that divine light which everywhere shone around him. Tyndale would not have that soul perish through carelessness. His charity buried all the faults of the monarch. He prayed that those sins might be blotted out from before the face of God. He would have saved Henry VIII at any cost, 
While the executioner was fastening him to the post, the reformer exclaimed in a loud and suppliant voice, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. They were his last words. Instantly afterwards, he was strangled and flames consumed the martyr's body. His last cry was wafted to the British Isles and repeated in every assembly of Christians. A great death had crowned a great life. Such, says the old chronicler John Fox, such is the story of that true servant and martyr of God, William Tyndale, who for notable pains and travail may well be called the apostle of England in this our latter age. William Tyndale died because he knew the scriptures were clear, and today we benefit. Even Grace Bible Church owes a great debt to William Tyndale and should praise God for the way that he used him and other men and women who gave their blood uh, to have God's clarity. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for uh, the, the stories of uh, so many men and women who uh, labored to uh, put your word in our hands and thank you for using them. I pray that we would uh, gratefully draw near to you through your word, even as the word is opened up, as the word is sung and in the main service today and at the evening service. God, I do pray that we would uh, lift up grateful hearts to you for your word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.